And tonight, I'd like to share with you some of my ideas about the rights of Chinese economy and its opportunities and ideas for the structural transformation in Africa. I think you may know, China was trapped in poverty for centuries before its miraculous rise in 1979. And according to the World Bank statistics, at the end of 1978, the per capita income in China was 155 US dollars per year, less than one third of the average of sub Saharan African countries' average. And at that time, 81% of the people live in rural areas and 78% of the population live below the international poverty lines of $1.25 a day. At that time, the export was a very small portion of the Chinese economy, only 9.5% of GDP involved in export and import. And 75% of China's export at that time was either agricultural product or processed agricultural product. But since 1979, things changed dramatically. The average annual growth rate of China's GDP was 9.8% per year, continuously for 35 years. We never observed such a high rate of the growth to be sustained for such a long time in human history. And the trade growth rate was even more remarkable. It was 16 0.6% per year, continuously for 35 years. With that kind of performance, certainly now the per capita income in China by the end of 2013 reached 6,800 US dollars, was more than four times of the average of sub-Saharan African countries, from less than one third to now more than four times. And 680 million people got out of poverty. And uh, I think that was the reason why I was elected to be the chief economist of the World Bank. And with this kind of growth rate, in 2009, China overtook Japan to be the second largest economy in the world. In 2010, China overtook Germany to be the largest exporters of the world. In 2013, China overtook US to be the largest trading countries in the whole world. Trading country means export plus import. And according to the IMF, and the US, uh, the, the World Bank studies. This year, China will overtake US to be the largest economy in the world, measured by purchasing power parities. And tonight, I'd like to share with you some of my ideas to five questions. The first one, why it was possible for China to have such a remarkable performance up to 1979. And the second question was, how come it was impossible for China to have similar performance before 1979? And answer, maybe China started to have the transition from the planned economy to market economy in 1979, well, we know 
all the socialist country and the most developing country in the 1980s and 1990s, they also, trans they also started to transit from government debt, planning economy, to a market economy. But most of them failed, collapsed. And how come they could not have similar performance as China had in the past three and a half decades? And then my first question is that, can African country, now the poorest continent in the world, have a similar performance as China had in the past 35 years? And the last question, I'd like to make a little bit analysis about the rise of China and its opportunities offered to the African development. For the first question, the answer actually is very simple. The advantage of backwardness. We know that rapid economic growth is a modern phenomenon. According to economic historian Angus Madison and others, before the 18th century, the economic growth rate in the world, including the Western Europe, was tiny. It was about 0.05% per year in the growth rate of per capita income. That means that it took about 1,400 years for people in Western Europe to double its per capita income. And from the 18th century to the mid 19th century, all of a sudden, the growth rate jumped 20 times from 0.05% per year to 1% per year. And the year it took to double the per capita income reduced from 1,400 years down to 70 years. And from the mid 19th century to now, the developed country in Western Europe, North America, their growth rate of per capita income further doubled from 1% to 2%. And so now it took about 35 years to double per capita income in the high-income countries. And how could such a dramatic changes occur in Western Europe, in North America? We know it was because of the Industrial Revolution, which started in UKs in the 18th century. With the Industrial Revolution, technological innovation and industrial upgrading accelerated. And with that, certainly, the labor productivity increased very rapidly, per capita income can increase very rapidly. And for developed country, what developing country, if they want to have sustained economic growth, certainly they need to have continuous technological innovation or industrial upgrading to move from agricultural to manufacturing and to post-industrialization in order to raise their per capita income and economic growth rate. But there's a difference between developed country and developing country. Because after the Industrial Revolution, the developed country, their technology and their industries are only global frontiers. So if they want to have technological innovation or industrial upgrading, they need to invent the technology or the industries. And we know that the cost of invention is very high. The risk of invention is even higher. And that's the reason why we observe for the developed country, as I mentioned, the average annual growth rate of per capita income was about 2% per year in the past in 150 years. And a plus population growth rate, maybe ranging between half a percent to 1%. So the average annual growth rate in the high-income countries in the past century was about 
2.5 to 3 percent. But for a developing country, technological innovation and industry upgrading move within the global frontiers. So that means that they can borrow mature technology which has been used in high-income country as the source of their technological innovation and the source of their industrial upgrading. And those kind of technological borrowing certainly means the cost and the risk are both smaller. And they can grow faster if they know how to use those kind of so-called advantage of backwardness. And uh, according to the data we know, after the Second World War, there were certain economies find a trick to tap into the advantage of backwardness and achieve you know, the, an economic performance of 7% or more growth rate continuously for 25 or more years. And that means their growth rate was three times more than the growth rate in the high income country, two or three times. And China became one of those 13 economies in the world up to 1979. So that means the answer to the first question, actually, it's quite simple. The advantage of backwardness. But if the advantage of backwardness was the reason for the you know, miraculous performance after 1979, the advantage of backwardness has been there for a century before 1979. And how come the economic performance before 1979 was very poor. I think that related to two issues. The first one, before the 1950s, China, like many other developing world, was you know, enduring a long period of certainly civil wars and foreign invention and so on. And with that, certainly it was impossible to develop the economies. After 1949, the socialist government took over and brought the stability to China and started to pursue its modernization. But the issue at that time was the development strategies because with the intention to catch up the high income country, China adopted a strategy with two slogans. One was to overtake the United Kingdom in 15 years and to catch up the US in 10 years. So that means what? In the early 1950s, the government program was to develop the similar large scale capital intensive modern industry as those industries prevailed in the United Kingdom and in the US. But at that time, China was a poor agrarian economy. And capital was scarce, but those kind of large scale modern industry was kept intensive. So they were not the competitive advantage of the Chinese economy. And because of the Chinese government wanted to develop those kind of large-scale money industry immediately, China could not benefit from the advantage of backwardness for two reasons. One, all those kind of industry technologies were still protected by patent. And not only so, those kind of industry related to national security, the strength of the high-income country. So the high-income country were not willing to allow those kind of technology to be bottled. And if China wanted to develop those kind of industries, China needed to reinvent the wheels. So China gave up the advantage of backwardness by those kind of strategies. And as I mentioned, not only so. Those kind of industries were not China's competitive advantages. In an open competitive market, Firm in those kind of priority sectors were not viable. Were not viable. 
So their investment and the continuous operation rely on the government support. So the government use all kind of you know, distortion and administrative measures to mobilize resources to make investment in those kind of areas and give protection subsidies, allow them to continue to be there. Certainly, these kind of strategies you know, allow China to be able to test the nuclear bomb in 1960s and to launch the satellite in 1970s. But they went against China's competitive advantage. That means the resource allocation were very poor. And the incentive of the workers or the managers were repressed. As a result, the economic efficiency was very low. And only after 1979, China changed its strategies, started to develop the light labor intensive energy, which are consistent with the abundant supply of the labor force in China. That you know, consists with China's competitive advantages. Since they are consistent with China's competitive advantages, they can be very competitive. And with the competitiveness, certainly they earn more profit, they create economic surplus, and so with the capital accumulation, China could upgrade the industry step by step, and in the upgrading of the industries, China could benefit from the advantage of backwardness. So the reason why China did not do well was the wrong strategies and uh, gave up the opportunity to utilize the advantage of backwardness and also create all kind of distortion and inefficiency. But here is that. We know that after the Second World War, all the socialist countries you follow the Stalinist model. So they had the same problem of trying to develop large-scale heavy industries on the basis of poor agrarian economies. Not only the socialist country, actually all the developing country, after the Second World War, they gained their political independence, started to pursue their modernization under the leadership of their national fathers. And they were also influenced by the same ideas, try to develop the large scale modern industries immediately because at the time they sought. Only with those kind of industries, they can be powerful modern countries. But they came into the same problem because those kind of industries went against their competitive advantages. The firm in those kind of sectors were not viable, so they also introduced all kind of distortion, protection, and subsidies in order to build up those kind of industries. And certainly, like China, their economic performance were very poor. So when China started to have a transition from the planning economy to a market economy in late 1970s, early 1980s, almost all the developing countries, no matter socialist, were not socialist. They all started to have a transition from the government-led development strategies to market economies. But the difference is that China continued to grow dynamically for 35 years. But most other developing countries in a socialist camp and non-socialist camp, when they started this economic transition from the government-led intervene economy to market economy, their economy collapsed, stagnant, and uh, you know, hit by crises from time to time, instead of the dynamic economic growth. How come the problem seems to be the same? Try to move away from the government debt growth to market-based economy. And how come China grow, you know, have been you know, growing so rapidly and other economies perform poorly? And according to some research, actually the average annual growth rate of the developing country. In the 1980s, 1990s, during the transition periods, were even lower than the average annual growth rate in the 1960s and 1970s. 
and the crisis in the 1980s and 1990s, the frequency of that was even higher than in the 1960s and 1970s. So some economists refer 1980s, 1990s as lost decades for the developing world. How come the problem at the beginning was the same and they all had a transition, but China performed so outstanding and others performed so poorly? My answer to that, again, is very simple. It's related to the transition strategies. Because when transition started in socialist country, in Eastern European country, former Soviet Union, or in Latin America, in Africa, and so on, they adopt the Washington Consensus and influenced by the neoliberalism. At that time, the perception for the economic perforation was that. The reason why the socialist country and other developing country to have a poor performance was because they have too many government distortion and interventions. And they did not have a well-functioning market economy as in a high-income country. So the recommendation according to the Washington Consensus was to remove all those distortion in order to establish well-functioning market economy and to have good in a resource allocation and to have good incentive for the economic agent. However, they forget, they forget. Those kind of distortions were designed as a way to protect the non-viable firms in the priority sectors. If the government wanted to remove those kind of distortion simultaneously and quickly by the so-called Big Bang approach or shock therapies. All those firms will go bankrupt, right? But they employ a huge number of workers, 30%, 40%, or even 50% of their workers. And most of them concentrate in the cities. If all of a sudden you have 30, 40% of unemployment, you could not have social stability and political stability. Without that, you cannot grow your economy. And for fear of those kind of consequences, plus, many countries still view those kind of industries as the backbone of their modernization, their national security. Without those kind of capital intensive heavy industries, they could not have military defense. And also for that reason, many government, even after implement the Washington Consensus Reform tried to privatize them, marketize them, liberalize them. The government reintroduced from back door all kinds of increased subsidies and protections. And a lot of story now found actually those kind of implicit or disguised subsidies and protections was even less efficient than the distortion and subsidies in the past. And that's the reason why the economy collapsed, stagnant, and uh, were visited by crises frequently. And China adopted a different strategies. China adopted some kind of very pragmatic, gradual, dual track approach, with the recognition of those kind of heavy industries, without protection, they will all go bankrupt. So the Chinese government continuously to provide some kind of transitory protection to the older sectors in order to maintain stability. And the Chinese government simultaneously liberalized the entry to the new sectors, which are labor intensive, light manufacturing, and so on. And at the beginning, the infrastructure business environment in China were very poor but the government pro some, provide some kind of facilitation to you know, set up industrial park spatial economic zone. Within the industrial park spatial economic zone, the infrastructure would be reasonable. And the business environment for the whole nations was very poor, but the government you know, adopted one-stop services in the industrial park and the spatial economic zones. So the business environment for the whole nation may be very poor, but the business environment 
within the industrial park and uh, 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 spatial economic zone was extremely good. And uh, at the beginning, certainly, as I said, China was quite an inward-looking country. And uh, when China wanted to enter into the global markets, how can the Chinese firm to gain the confidence of international buyer? So at that time, the Chinese government played some kind of active investment promotion to attract firm in Taiwan, in Korea, in Japan, in other parts of the world to make investment in China and to help China to link to the global markets. So with those kind of strategies, China was able to maintain stability and tap into the advantage of backwardness and grow you know, dynamically in the past 35 years. And with this kind of understanding, so the answer to the, third, the fourth question seems to be very simple to me also. I think African country and every developing country, they should have the possibility to perform as well as China if they have the right ideas. The right ideas are first, they should develop their economies according to their competitive advantages. If they develop their economies according to their competitive advantages, they will have the lowest possible factor cost of production. And they also should tap into the advantage of backwardness. That means they need to grow step by step in order to benefit from the advantage of backwardness in technological innovation and industrial grading. By that, they can have low cost of technological innovation, low risk of technological innovation, and industrial grading. That's first principle, first idea. Secondly, the government should play some kind of active for this facilitation role. Because if you want to be competitive in the international markets, you need to be able to produce the goods which the quality can be accepted by international markets. And uh, at a lower cost than your competitors. And uh, the cost in general consists of two components. The first one certainly factor cost of production because in the production you need to use capital, labor, natural resources. And as I mentioned, if you follow your competitive advantages, factor cost of production will be low. But you also need to reduce your transaction cost because total cost you know, consists of factor cost of production and transaction cost. And it's transaction cost related to how good is your infrastructure? How good is your business environment? Your infrastructure is poor and the business environment is poor then your transaction cost will be very high, and the total cost can be too high. So the government need to help reduce the transaction cost by improving the infrastructure and the business environment. But the government resource is limited. If you want to improve the infrastructure for the whole nation, then it may take generation to reach you know, good infrastructure. And if you want to improve the business environment for the whole nations, again, you need to have a lot of implementation capacities. And also, good institution in country at a different stage may be different. And so under that kind of situation, the government should also be pragmatic. Use its limited resources to create a localized, good infrastructure, good business environment, like industrial park, spatial economic zones, in the parks, in the zones, make infrastructure you know, reasonable and uh, make the business procedure very simple by some kind of one-stop services and so on. By that, I think every country will have the ability to create localized good environment. And as I mentioned, if your product wanted to get into the international markets, you need to gain the confidence of the buyer that you will be able to deliver the goods with consistent quality and deliver the good in time 
we know that if they do not deliver in time, then you know, the price before the Christmas and after Christmas will be too much difference, right? And how to gain those kind of confidence? The best way is to invite the producers who already are in this global value chain to relocate their production to your country. If we can do that, I think every country will have these opportunities to grow dynamically. I started to promote these ideas. When I was the chief economist of the World Bank, certainly this idea was quite foreign to my colleagues at World Bank and also in the, you know, in the academics. So I started to do some kind of pilot. In 2010, I commissioned a study called Light Manufacturing in Africa. And I select Ethiopia, Tanzania, and also Gambia to do Zambia to do the study about the possibility to develop light manufacturing, like shoes, garment in those countries. And with this study I found, like shoes, the labor cost in Ethiopia was only about one-tenth of the labor cost of China. The wage rate in China was about 500 US dollars a month. And in Ethiopia, it was only about 50 US dollars a month, one-tenth. And with about three months training, the labor productivity in Ethiopia can reach 70% of the labor productivity in China. And labor cost is about 25% of the total cost. And so if the, you know, if the Ethiopia has the ability to invite the shoemaker to relocate their production from China to Ethiopia, certainly immediately the labor cost for the firm will be reduced dramatically. And the labor, you know, the shoe sector is very labor intensive. In 2010, China employed 19 million workers in shoe sectors. And Ethiopia at that time, only 8,000. And so with this kind of finding, I met the prime ministers of Ethiopia, met us in March 2011, and offered him this kind of you know, research findings and uh, provide him about how China started the shoe expo business in China. And uh, he was a very you know, intelligent person. Immediately he got the message. So he went to China in August 2011 to do active investment promotion targeting the shoe business. And so he invited a Chinese shoemaker called Hua Jian Shoemaker. That was one of the largest lady shoe producers in China. And that company employed 25,000 workers producing designer lady shoe for Expo to the US and to the European markets. And because the Prime Minister invite the you know, entrepreneur, so the entrepreneur say, well, since I have this kind of personal relation with the Prime Minister, so he went to, he did a delegation to visit Addis Ababa in October 2011. And he was convinced the opportunity. So, he immediately recruited 86 workers, sent them back to China for training of three months, and started an operation of two production lines with 600 workers in January 2012. By the end of the year, the employment increased to 2,000. And this firm alone, in one year, more than double the laser export of Ethiopia to, you know, 
to, to, to the U.S. markets. And now the employment in these companies is about 4,000. And so this idea seemed to work. And with this kind of encouragement, you know, before 2012, no one really believed Ethiopia can be the manufacturing base for the international market because it's one of the poorest countries with a very poor infrastructure. And it, was a, it is a landlocked country. But with this kind of ideas of setting up industrial parks and uh, active government you know, facilitation investment promotion, and all of a sudden, the impression about Ethiopia changes. With the success experiences in 2012, the Ethiopia government set up another industrial park. And uh, the first phase of the industrial park was to build 22 factory units. And uh, in 2013, you know, eight were built and 14 were to be built. But within three months, all those 22 units were leased to 22 export-oriented companies, you know, either in garment or in shoes. And, 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 and not only so, the international buyers, now they also set up their procurement offices in Addis Ababa. So that means these kind of ideas you know, work because if you look into the doing business indicators, actually Ethiopia dropped from 125, based on the World Bank measurement, from 125 to 127. 125 in 2012, 127 in 2013. But Ethiopia now become the hardest places in Africa for attracting the foreign direct investment and for you know, active growth in the manufacturing export. So I think that if African country and other developing country can follow this kind of ideas with the government active promotion, facilitation to target sectors which they have competitive advantages and create a localized environment to facilitate the investment and so on. And to tap into the advantage of backwardness, I think every country will have the opportunity to grow dynamically. And especially China, may offer huge opportunity, window opportunity for their industrialization. Because now China's per capita income, as I mentioned last year, 6,800. And the wage rate of the blue collar workers, the entry level was about 500 US dollars to 600 US dollars. And it will continue to grow. And China now reached the same stage at Japan in 1960s, and a Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore in 1980s. And with the rise of this kind of wage rate in China, China will lose competitive advantages in the light manufacturing, shoes, garment, toys, and other you know, manufacturing products. So like Japan in the 1960s, because of the success of the growth, the rise of its wages, Japan relocate is manufacturing to Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and help those four East Asian dragons to start their industrialization and modernization and, and process. In the 1980s, the wage rate in those four small dragons, like Japan, also rise, and they relocated their in our manufacturing, that manufacturing to China, help China to tap into the global market and to have the success story as I just discussed. Now China reached the same stage. But the difference is size. In 1960s, Japan employed 9.7 million workers in the manufacturing sectors. In the 1980s, Korea employed 2.3 million, Taiwan, less than two million. Hong Kong, about one million. And Singapore, about half a million. But this time, 
the employment in the manufacturing sector in China is about 85 million workers. 85 million workers. And I think within 10 years, those kind of 85 million jobs will have to be relocated to other countries with the lower wages. And currently, in African countries, their total employment in modern manufacturing sectors is only about 10 million. So with the pending relocation of the light manufacturing industries from China to other developing countries, if African country or other developing country they follow the policy otherwise, pragmatic policy otherwise, as I just lay out. I think they will have the same opportunity to rely on their competitive advantages and to tap into the advantage of backwardness and also to enter into the global value chain and to grow at 8% or more continuously for several decades and to move from low income to middle income within one generation and maybe another generation they can become high income country also. So maybe we have the hope to have a world free of poverty if we have the right ideas to develop the economy. Thank you.